Thank you so much, Namilan, for that uh, introduction. And thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've been a huge fan of Yvette's work since I sh saw her show at the Contemporary in Bentonville last year. And I was really delighted to be able to see this show in person. And I'm just thrilled to be in conversation with you, Yvette, today, tonight. Um, and I just, I, I wanted to start off with the title of your show, Dreaming of You. Um, I really love the evocative titles that you give to so many of your artworks, um, some of which include the names of artists or paintings from the past, but which also bring in your own personal history and also more contemporary re uh, references. Um, I did a Google search. I think Dreaming of You is a pop song by the Mexican-American singer Selena. So that might be one inspiration for your title, but I just wanted to ask you just to kind of start off by saying, why did you choose this as the title for this show? Um, and who does the you refer to? Yeah, it's a great question. And I just wanted to say, I'm also really excited to be in conversation with you. And um, it's just really amazing to have your knowledge and, you know, your interest and, you know, deep research in 18th century and have that lens uh, to look through my work and to have um, a conversation about it is, is really exciting for me um so dreaming of you came about as i was making making the work and it's funny you're you're right actually it is a title of a song by selena and i think it probably came up subconsciously um, but as i was thinking about titles of the work i kept thinking about this idea of dreaming about me and also dreaming about my family so originally i had thought about dreaming of you and me to talk about like this this deep connection that I have um, and deep interest in, in telling and archiving my family's stories and history within my practice. So it's, it's so much about me, but it's also a lot about them. And so I thought that dreaming of you um, really spoke to that, to this kind of moment in my practice that has continued from its inception of me looking at my family's history and the past within my family's history in order to look at the future. So really thinking about them as I think about myself. Yeah, that's really, um, well, that's a wonderful start. And also, you know, the dreams and the kind of the Rococo aesthetic, there's, there's so much to say about that as well in terms of the history of kind of dreaming and art, but I think also the personal intimacy that your, your work invokes is really um, one of the many things that I find so so compelling about it. But just to just to stick with the the issue of titles for a moment, um, I noticed that you also often use pop music references um, in titles to your works. For example, Ice Ice Lady, which is a reference to the hit 90s song Ice Ice Baby. But of course, it's also evoking the immigrations and customs enforcement. So a really different kind of ice. Um, and I want to touch on that issue and come back to that a bit later on. Um, but before I do that, I wondered if you could say something about these pop music citations and about music specifically. Um, are these kind of similar to other pop cultural references that you have, you know, for, for instance, to toys like Hello Kitty or Polly Pocket? Or is there something really specific about music and the way that it can invoke dreams, personal histories or, or memories? Yeah, you know, there's, it's a similar way in which I'm referencing these objects, these toys, um, these moments in time, and music is also included in, in that reference. For me, it's about nostalgia. It's about referencing this moment in time um, that I'm having these memories that, you know, that I'm drawn to, which is like the early 90s and growing up in the 90s here in the U.S. And and so it's, it's really about placemaking for me. It's about... Um, referencing the specific moment but it's also about being playful sort of being a trickster in the work where um i'm having a play on words but you know i'm having a, a moment to reference art history but i'm also having a moment to reference um consumerism and you know these commodities and all of these um things sort of come together through text and i find the titles to be a moment where i can really have the the viewer delve into the work in another way where um you know it it it, it kind of gives them more of an idea of where 
my uh, research and headspace was at when making the work is through reading the title. Like it, I see it as an extension of the work also. Yeah, I mean, it also like it it registers on so many different levels, you know, which I think is is really interesting. And it kind of makes me think about the way that history and especially for a lot of artists, the Rococo, it gets kind of mediated through all these different filters. It reminds me a little bit of like, you know, someone like Sofia Coppola making Marie Antoinette and then having this soundtrack with more contemporary music. And I think that allows you to connect, you know, to the work in this really powerful way and walking through your show. I felt like it had a kind of soundtrack or something. And also like, a, I don't know if you've ever worked with scent in your in your work, but it had a kind of smell. And then I realized I was wearing my daughter's jacket when I was there and she's really into this new perfume Sol de Janeiro, which like all of the <laughs> preteens are buying. So, but there's something very like multi-sensory, like sound and music. And anyway, it was uh, it was great to kind of have that as well as the the visual and the sort of strong like sense of touch in your work, which we'll, we'll come to, but. Um, just to say that, you know, as a as an 80, 18th century art historian, um, I'm really fascinated by your your deep engagement with the Rococo and also your kind of subversion of the Rococo aesthetic. Um, and I'm I'm just, you know, I've I've noticed this, I've 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 researched this, I've studied this, but I, I think it's really interesting that um, you know, why is it that the Rococo, which has been so often kind of dismissed as this, you know, this frivolous style, this kind of meaningless, superficial or elitist style has proven really in the past decade and, and maybe longer um, to be so generative, you know, for a really wide, a really diverse range of contemporary artists um, who use it to explore really deep and kind of complex issues of uh, politics, of class and identity. I mean, you you do this in this really fascinating way in your work, but why do you think the Rococo is such a touchstone for a lot of artists? Personally, to me, I think it's it's, so interesting because it's the moment in, in art history that has often been overlooked because of all these sort of preconceived notions that are attributed to this time, like the work being, you know, frivolous, the work being about um, gender, um, the work being excessive. And um, I think often the conversation stops there. Um, I know that there's obviously a lot of work that's being done now and in the past to to talk about all of these sort of deep rooted connections that you know Rococo has to colonialism, you know the connection between porcelain and sugar. But I often find that um, the moment in in art history kind of gets stopped at, at the frivolous, and I sort of feel the same way about contemporary histories of you know Latinx narratives, and so. For me, it felt personally like the, you know, kind of like these two underdogs in a way, just in the same way that Pink is, that maybe these three underdogs that could come together to have a powerful conversation around world building in my practice. And um, I think that they could also all individually um, exist on their own and be as powerful, but personally in my language and my interest in aesthetic, I was really drawn to fuse all three of them. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that I, I didn't visit an art museum until I was 18. And so the interiors of the Catholic church really, you know, formed my taste and my aesthetic. And, you know, they were often very Baroque and Rococo um, because I was in, inside churches um, in Mexico for most of my adolescence, uh, you know, which because of colonialism have these very European um, architecture and aesthetics. And so, um, yeah, I think, you know, I think that combined to me there, it's very powerful. It's a very powerful tool for me to talk about, um, the hyper fan while also talking about, um, you know, these Latinx narratives in relation to my family history with labor and the, the idea of the American dream. Yeah, and I um I was also kind of curious to know whether you see that the the kind of current contemporary engagement with the Rococo, especially among Latinx scholars, but maybe, uh, artists, but also maybe scholars like Jillian Hernandez, and do you see a kind of connection or a sort of link with the ways that earlier artists and curators, for example, somebody like Amalia Mesa Baines, um, invoked this aesthetic and kind of used it in earlier periods in the eighties and nineties? Um, I think. 
I read somewhere that you you cited her and the Domesticata movement as as one of the inspirations for your work. And so I was just curious to know if you saw any differences between the kind of interest in the Rococo in that period and now, either in your work or in the work of other contemporary Latinx artists. You know, I think she mentioned um, somewhere, I can't remember specifically, but she had said that these terms that these terms such as um, domesticana can evolve over time or that it can change meaning. And so I think that that's sort of what's happening now. And, you know, this movement was a um, it's sort of a re- reaction to Raspachismo, which was very male dominated and male centered, where domesticana is looking more at, you know, working class women's um, aesthetics and inventiveness of of working with everyday materials in reference to the home. And so, you know, I don't have a term for the current moment, but I think that it, it's it's an evolution from, from these um, times in art history. And um, I think that's, that's what makes the current work that's happening so um, powerful because we're drawing on these very important times in Latinx, Chicanx art history in order to talk about the present and the future. And scholars like Jillian Hernandez are a perfect example of that. Um, you know, and Amalia Mesa Banks was really one of the first artists um, that I saw working in this very heavy material kind of way um, that really allowed me to think, think about how I could match um, gender, religion, um, you know, identity politics, like the personal archive as all of these mediums that could come together to create these sort of immersive installations. And so um, I'm really thankful for her, for her work as an artist and um, a scholar and, you know, artists like her have really paved the way for, for artists like me today. I think it would be a great moment to do a kind of survey, you know, sort of Neo Rococo, especially within, you know, sort of Latinx artists across times and spaces and these kinds of immersive installations that could be a really cool um, thing to do. But I think, you know, my own view of, I don't know what we call it, but, you know, the neo Rococo trend and contemporary art, you know, my own sense of it is that it's, it's really kind of open and expansive and, you know, you might call it a kind of a big tent. So um, I would consider a lot of artists whose works don't really look particularly Rococo, but who kind of tap into conceptual ideas associated with the Rococo, you know, could be kind of considered alongside this group. So people who are exploring kind of the fluidity and the malleability of identity, especially gender identity, and also kind of the role of commodities and sort of facilitating this play, you know, so you could maybe consider someone kind of structurally linked to the Rococo, but not like, maybe that's not so visually evident in their work. But in your case, of course, I think it's very visually and, and you know, materially overt and, and deliberately so, right? Um, and of course, at the same time, you know, I'm really interested in the ways that you um, kind of update and, you know, transform typical Rococo forms, you know, make them meaningful and relevant, you know, for, for you know, for your own kind of personal history, but also for the present, for the present moment. Um, and so, you know, for one example is just your your recurring use of a typical kind of Rococo S-curve, which sometimes gets transformed into this pink slide that you can see sort of winding its way through your ceramic piece or through paintings in your show. Um, could you say a little bit about your, you know, your kind of repurposing of these Rococo forms and maybe also something about the slide in particular as a motif? Yeah, I, th- I, you know, I think that it was really amazing that you drew that connection between the S-curve and the slide um, because the slide is a reference to the game and the toy Polly Pocket. And, you know, it's this sort of moment that happens within my work of rescue or freedom or being able to sort of escape this moment of surveillance. And it's it's a moment of dreaming and looking at the future outside of what is presented in front um, of you within the work, whatever d- the domestic space or the scene that I'm portraying is. It's, it's looking at the future, but it does resemble an S. And these sort of motifs of the S were something that were very prominent within my home, specifically within these gilded gold, you know, mirrors that were often made out of plastic, but had like this repetitive S as like, you know, an embellishment and something that 
uh, we lived with, but didn't necessarily question or think about its sort of relationship um, to our history, why we were attracted to the specific kind of um, to the specific kind of design, but also to um, this idea of access. And um, in my work, I'm also posing that question of really, it's a celebration, but it's also a critique of Rococo and thinking deeply about why we are so drawn to this sort of aesthetic and why um, owning objects that have this specific tie to, to this taste and this time in uh, history, why does that um, also reference this sort of idea of making it in America or this idea of having um, a sort of abundance uh, which is also linked to, you know, ideas around um, colonialism and um, ideas around the American dream. But it's it's really interesting to draw the reference between the two because they are separate, but they're also um, tied together. Mm. Yeah, let's get into a little bit of the, you know, the kind of critical take on the Rococo. I think that's really um worth exploring. And, you know, in your work, you have all these references to childhood innocence and play, but I think also to a kind of, maybe not even undertone, like a kind of, there's a kind of violence um, in terms of certain motifs, um, certain references. Um, and, you know, as a historian, thinking about, you know, your kind of repurposing of the Rococo, I, I find that really fascinating because I also see that there's these undertones of, of violence and these references to colonialism um, within the historical works that you're looking at, you know, and they're sort of deceptively simple, kind of frivolous or, you know, cheerful veneers. And I think in in historic terms, it's it's really related to the way that, you know, the Rococo and, and the sort of white elite patrons with whom it was associated at that time um, were really structurally dependent on these brutal practices of, of colonialism and enslavement. I mean, for many Rococo patrons, that's what actually that's how they made their wealth, um, you know, through plantation ownership and so on. So that's what kind of funded these works. And then, of course, you also have resource extraction and materials that are made available through colonial commerce that then, you know, become utilized in the creation of Rococo decorative arts. And I think one, you know, one obvious example would be like these really flamboyant, ornate Rococo sugar sculptures that would adorn the tables of, you know, elites in, in 18th century France and sugar being a product of enslaved labor and, and a kind of, you know, major source of, of France's wealth. And so there's that kind of, you know, sweetness, but then this sort of undertone of um, the sort of darkness underneath. Um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of parallels that I see between that kind of historical situation and, and your own work in terms of legacies of, of racism, colonialism, and capitalism. But, you know, as you say, I think it, this hint of violence also speaks to more contemporary issues that you're um, working through, you know, issues of, of immigration, of, of surveillance, you know, going back to that the other kind of ice that gets referenced and, and to the dark underside of the American dream. Um, so could you say just maybe a little bit more about that, this kind of tension between the play or the pleasure and, and the violence in your work? Yeah, definitely. For me, it felt very important to have my work serve as an archive for current injustices that have happened in the past um, within the history of my family um, and also that are happening present day. I, I really want it to serve as an archive for these specific moments to not be forgotten, but then also as an advocate for um, you know these complicated stories and for the narrative to have more of a you know 360 uh, view and to not have it be so sort of simplified as it usually is um, but to me you know pleasure and violence really happens simultaneously while we're having pleasure someone somewhere is having some sort of violence and vice versa and so to me it's it's something that can sort of coexist because a lot of um, these sort of moments of leisure that we have come at the hands of many injustices and violences that we cannot see. And so it only makes sense to me to use this 
this uh you know material that's referencing sugar that already has like such a rich deep history within colonialism to paint these depictions of modern day violences and injustices you know it's 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 a it's a commentary on the material itself and and the violent history that ha it has it's also like I mentioned before, a celebration of Rococo, but also a critique of, of the moment in, in art history. And it's important to have these histories happen um, within the you know reference of these uh, Rococo art historical paintings by Fragonard or Boucher, because they wouldn't depict such scenes, you know, within art history. These these moments haven't been canonized within art history. And so it's, it's really important for, for them to, um, to exist. Yeah. And I think it, it hopefully inspires, you know, people to, to want to kind of look, to take a deeper look, I mean, both into your own work, but maybe also into the past and think about how they're, you know, in this kind of um, really fascinating dialogue. And, you know, one of the other aspects of your work that I find really resonates with um you know, the Rococo aesthetic is this this really this kind of rich material quality and this kind of sense of of touch that you want to you want to get up closer and you want to, you know, you want to really look at these surfaces. I don't say you want to like, you know, lick them or eat them or something, but there's a kind of aspect <laughs> to the, the, you know, that that sort of sugar and that really, really thick kind of painting aesthetic that that you've um developed. And, you know, I think one of the there's not a whole lot of body of like theory behind the Rococo. Part of it was to kind of liberate itself from painting that had to be, you know, to have a kind of royal um, message or be a form of propaganda or to be really moralizing or didactic. And, you know, the one um, like writer who who said something about the Rococo, this guy Roger Depi, said that, you know, the point of art is not to teach a lesson, but to seduce, you know, to call people to want to get up closer. And I think your work really, you know, gets people to want to, to want to move up closer and, and to, to look at this this technique. And I wonder, you know, you're referencing sugar, but also a kind of cake icing. Um, and I just wonder if you, do you want to say a little bit more about that as a, as a material practice, but maybe also as a kind of theme cake icing in particular. Yeah, definitely. For me, it's, it's another material. It's another layer in the work where um, similar to all, you know, these references and subject matter that I'm speaking on, there's all these preconceived notions attached to them, similarly to, to this material that references cake. So as soon as you see the work, you, you think that it's edible, you think that it, it, you, maybe you react and think that it has a, a sense or you feel drawn to it or to want to, you know, explore it a little bit deeper, get closer to it. And to me, that's, that's the, you know, the third layer of the work that is, is, is done purposefully so that the viewer will feel drawn, will feel really invited to get up close to the work and to spend more time with it, to really sit with it and to start to, the longer you sit with it, you start to uncover all the layers that are really behind this, you know, cake-like material um, that, you know, end up not being so sweet after a while. But they're also sweet because like I said earlier, I think that both pleasure and violence can, you know, coexist at once. And all, not all of the work is sort of drawing on both of these things in tandem, but there's there's definitely an undertone of that because of, you know, these labor histories and labor politics that are deeply rooted within the work and, and the creation of the work itself, where I'm referencing uh, gender labor specifically, you know, baking labor and in the process of creating the work, it's, it's it's honoring uh, familial labor, but it's also sort of creating this imagined legacy of this labor within my practice. And it's it's really interesting. the The longer I worked with this work with this material, and you know, had a lot of conversations uh, around um, labor specifically within my family. The more that I uncovered that my family has had a long history with with candy, with sweetness, um, through you know, having uh, different different jobs, specifically my mother as a baker here in Chicago, but then also my grandfather who worked at the Tootsie Tits Roll factory, both of my grandfathers. Um, so it's really interesting 
um, you know, this long history from the 60s to now um, within my family and these sort of um, ties to, to, to sugar and candy. Yeah, the um the image it's your father, right? Who's wearing the shirt with the Tootsie Roll. My grandfather. Your grandfather, yeah. And the um yeah, there were all these being being able to see the work in, in person, I think it it really adds this other level of getting up close to it. And as you say, like being sort of seduced and drawn and, and kind of invited through the sweetness and this kind of invitation. And then when you you get up to it, some of that is, is still very much there, but there's also a kind of a sort of surprise and a bit of an uh oh moment. Like I didn't, I had seen the, you know, the images of the soldiers and the, you know, ice, like the some of the figures in your works, but I didn't notice, for instance, that one of the vases that the kind of Rococo scrolls that they're actually guns. That so, you know, you have this, you know, you 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 enter into this other dimension of thinking about um, issues of of labor, but also violence and and the interplay of those two, especially when you um, when you engage with it on this. Um, on this level. And I think, you know, the the formal and also the symbolic um, properties of, of materials, of the materials that you use in your work seem seem really important to you. And, uh, you know, I was interested to read that you had majored in fiber and, and material studies uh, when you were at the, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And, um, you know, we've talked about sugar and candy and cake icing as a kind of um, material, but there's also these historic references to sev porcelain or ceramics or toile de jouy textiles. Um, and these are all materials that are also kind of caught up in these early histories of capitalism, of of labor, of globalization and, and colonialism. And um, I think this is maybe the, I don't know if it's the first time that you've exhibited this large scale ceramic piece in the, in this exhibition, um, but I wonder if you it could is say- at the scale. Sorry, at the scale. Oh, was at the scale. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you could say a little bit about that, this kind of um, interest in, in ceramics and producing this piece and, and, and this material and its interest yes. you. Yeah, I definitely have delved into ceramics. It just had been a few years since I had worked with the material, I think since 2017. And so, but I've always been sort of interested in the relationship between porcelain sugar and you know and how that translates in ceramics and you know through looking at past sugar sculptures which was some of my earlier work in ceramics where I was reimagining sugar sculpture drawings with like these new references and inserting um, you know brown bodies within these landscapes um, but the new ceramics that I created this this past summer in Mexico, I was really interested in recreating or, you know, or, and also referencing some of the ceramic vessels that I paint on canvas, but actually to have them, you know, become vessels themselves in the 3D. And it was a really exciting time to also think about what it would mean for me to make work in Mexico. It's sort of like a, you know, also a migration in a way, which I had never produced work in Mexico. My family's from that state of Jalisco, um, where I did the residency at Ceramica Sudo. And so it felt very grounding and inspiring to be on site there and think about, you know, Clay's relationship to the land, but then also Clay's relationship to my family history and sort of all of these craft practices within my family that got lost or left behind um, after migration and thinking through them while making the ceramic work and having some of those references come across in the ceramics, but while also using, you know, the tools of, you know, cake decorating to think through how to, to, to form and to shape ceramics. So it was a lot of um, experimentation and, um, you know, processes of trying to get sort of the, the clay to sort of uh, work just like frosting or to have the same kind of consistency. Um, but it's definitely a medium that I'm really excited to continue working with. And um, I will continue to, to make more ceramic work this summer. Um, so it's something that will definitely be a, a continuation. Oh, great. I look forward to seeing 
future projects. And, you know, I love that idea of making a material kind of do something else or kind of, you know, behave in a somewhat different way. And, and also the idea that you invoked of, you know, your own kind of, I don't know if they're really 2D works, but works that are on a wall kind of coming to life or being animated. I mean, I think that's a good um, seg for thinking about uh, this, another series that's in the show that I, that I want to talk about, um, you know, as a, I'm a big art history nerd. I think it's, it's, that's obvious. Uh, I think I can say that. And I love being able to kind of identify all the sources um, that you draw upon in your work. Um, and for this series that you did, these three portraits of your um, siblings that that's in this exhibition, I was really thrilled to see that you had been inspired by this series of 18th century prints by this German artist, um, Martin Engelbrecht. And these are prints that um, for people who may not be familiar with them. They're prints that depict um, artisans, laborers, like porcelain workers or clockmakers who are really kind of transforming into the tools of their trade. Um, and they're fascinating to me because I think they really tap into this important 18th century idea of inanimate objects coming to life or conversely of people turning into things. You know, and I think it's 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 no accident that um, the fairy tale Beauty and the Beast is an 18th century product. It was written by a woman, Madame de Villeneuve, um, in the middle of the 18th century. You know, long before Disney kind of took it over and popularized it and made it, you know, dancing teacups and and so on. Um, and I think you know historically this idea is is connected to this rise of of capitalism and and commodity culture where things start to not only kind of you know, reflect your identity or express your identity, but they really start to kind of replace your identity. You become the things that you make or, or that you consume. Um, and this is a, you know, an idea that has a lot of relevance today, but I also see it's some, something that you're um, engaging with in your work. And I wonder if you could just say a little bit about the relationship that you're kind of suggesting between people and things, you know, cell phones, toys, um, nails, other accessories, you know, what does that relationship to mean to you is, is, um, are these commodities like a kind of trap? Are they a form of liberation? Are they both? It's definitely, it's definitely both a com combination of both. I, I would say like where, you know, the, the image of the phone appears within the work as, as a re reference to technology, to, to freedom, but also to, you know, like news media, to, to the doom scrolling, to the anxieties of, of this generation and future generations, it becomes a reference to climate change, to, you know, constantly trying to be sort of updated and in the know with um, everything that's happening um, globally, politically. Um, it's it's about women's rights. It's, it's about all of these issues. They all kind of become, you know, you know, at the forefront of, of the phones where the, the screen becomes a moment to to think about what's happening sort of in the present and the sort of anxiety around um, these issues. But at the same time, um, there is also a separation between the objects and the individuals, specifically within these portraits. I really wanted to, to make that a point where when I came across um, Martin's work, I, I felt very excited about the prints, you know, just from an artistic standpoint, just the the scenery, the landscape in which these individuals are posed is really interesting and um, innovative in a way. But then I also sort of felt repulsed by, you know, these individuals becoming their labor. And, and so I wanted to have a more sort of radical approach to, to his drawings where instead of, you know, in Martin's lithographs, like the, the individuals become their labor in my portraits, the individuals have, you know, their identity first and then their labor is an after effect. So you see them first and then you get these small, you know, points of reference to, to their labor, but it's never proclaimed in the title or, you know, in the painting itself, what that specific labor is. Um, and so I thought of it as a very kind of powerful way to reimagine and uh, through my sort of world building what these lithographs could have, could have looked like now or could have looked like today. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're, you yourself are, are working on now or what's next? 
Yeah, so I'm currently working on um, a new body of work for a solo exhibition that I'm having um, this fall in Mexico at Museo Arte Zapopan. So it'll be my first uh, museum solo exhibition in Mexico, which is really exciting. It'll be a combination of paintings, installation, and then more ceramic work, like I mentioned earlier, that I'll create um, a month before my exhibition at Ceramica Suro. So um, it, I'm really excited to continue working in this avenue and to also continue to think about what it means for me to make work in Mexico and to also exhibit work in this scale for the first time um, in my parents' home state. And um, I will also be debuting a, a public artwork in New York City in the fall of 2025, a large scale public artwork commission. And so those are kind of the two really um, big projects that I have coming up and also some more public artwork happening here in Chicago. So oh. a lot. Yeah, I love this, your ability to work at these different scales, you know, the really kind of intimate and, um, and this large scale public work. Well, I have you know, I could talk with you all day. I have many, many more questions. <laughs> Maybe we should open it up. Um, Namulan, if there are any kind of questions that you all would want to ask or questions from the audience. Um, yeah, thank you time. both so much. Um, that was, oh my gosh, so ripe and um, really beautiful to hear a little bit more from you, Yva, about some of your interests that I hadn't heard before. Um, uh, Meredith, there was an article um, that you had written that Caitlin, the curator, and I had found that um, had said that Rococo invites us to go beyond being viewer or spectator to imaginatively touch, uh, taste, smell, uh, feel. And I feel like that is so prevalent in Yvette's work. Um, and as you both talked about with the seduction, um, I wonder if you could share a little bit more, Meredith, about how Rococo was a really modern style in the 18th century, especially in terms of materiality. So I'm thinking like the stucco that you mentioned in the article and gilt, because um, I think that relates to Yvette's work so well. Yeah, so I mean, most people may know this or may not, but Rococo wasn't actually a term that was used at the time, you know, during the real heyday of the style, mm -hmm. um, sort of in the second, third of the 18th century, it was called the modern style, the steel mode down. And um, the term Rococo was actually coined later around the time of the French Revolution. And it was meant to be like demeaning, you know, it was by a bunch of like super machismo, neoclassical artists, you know, who associated with feminine taste and, and patronage and it, you know, kind of continued to have, I think now that's one reason why it gets kind of mobilized, mobilized as this, right. um, you know, this potentially subversive style to, to explore issues of gender identity, gender fluidity, but um, uh, it was thought as, as really modern. Um, and I think partly because it wasn't freighted with all that kind of you know, royal intellectual baggage um, from the Louis the Fourteenth era. So it had a kind of freedom. It was something that, um, you know, it was it was elitist in the sense that, you know, throughout most of history, you had to have a lot of money to be able to kind of, you know, to to patronize to consume art. Artists had to be close to people with, um, you know, with money and connections. But these people weren't necessarily they hadn't necessarily been born noble. They were purchasing noble offices. A lot of them were these kind of financiers who were making fortunes through colonial commerce. Um, they didn't necessarily have the same kind of, you know, classical education. And, and so it, it appealed to, it was also accessible in a way, you mm -hmm. know, anyone could, could, could enjoy sort of themes of the pastoral, of, of love, of seduction. And you could also engage with it. You didn't necessarily have to engage with it on the level of subject matter, you know, it's also the the materiality, this interest in in brush strokes and texture, if you're thinking mm -hmm. about Coco paintings or or in decorative decorative arts. And I think if it had a kind of underlying connection to, you know, sort of philosophy, it, it was the sort of sensationalism or the um, empiricism of people like like John Locke, that all knowledge is derived from the senses, you know, mm -hmm. and so therefore, um, you know, Rococo interiors are really trying to kind of mobilize that concept, not just to get you to look at something visually to understand the story, but to really feel it, to experience it, you know, to even kind of imaginatively touch and and taste it. Um, and it it's really, you know, it's it's funny that it had this like deep association with these ideas of 
you know, sensory engagement and materialist philosophy. And so there was this kind of like deeper level at which you could access it, but you didn't necessarily have to be right. involved in those discussions to appreciate it. Oh, well, that's, I mean, such a generous um, um, outline of Rococo. Thank you for sharing that, Meredith. So, um, yeah, I, mean, I, I can also be really long-winded on that, so. <laughs> no, I mean, there's <laughs> just so much. Please so tell so us more. more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I have a question from the audience. The color pink is central to Yvette's practice, and I'm wondering if you can speak to its appeal and reception, both in the 18th century and in contemporary culture. Um, and also, Yvette, if you could share a little bit more about your um, initial interest with pink. It's really interesting. You know, I'm actually, I'm sort of rethinking my use of pink now where um, I'm imagining pink more as the sort of reference for skin color because during the 18th century, the combination of red and white created pink and was sort of used to, you know, identify whiteness and contrast to other skin color, darker skin color, and having, you know, the 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 pink sort of became this identifier of, of being able to be as close to whiteness. And so it's really interesting in the way in which oftentimes, you know, these portraits that I'm painting, all of the skin color, you know, within these portraits becomes pink and pink sort of becomes this um, new way of thinking about skin. And I'm sort of subverting this 18th century idea on pinkness and is, its association with whiteness, which I find really interesting. And I'm super interested in continuing to explore that like deeper within my practice. Um, but originally to me, like pink, you know, is the signifier of a femininity of like these ideals of gender of these sort of stereotypical notions that are prescribed to um, a, this color specifically and also to to labor that I'm referencing and so it was really exciting for me to use it as as a vehicle as a material in order to talk about um, you know family narratives and also these um, feminist uh, histories and, and also to talk about integration and to have it come to be in conversation with these sort of harder subject matter and narratives and it's often maybe two sort of components that you wouldn't see come together to speak about something like this and so just like Rococo I see pink as this other sort of underdog and material that I can use to, to sort of change the perception um, and these sort of preconceived notions and make uh, the viewers think about and question their identification with the color and why they feel that way in the same manner that um, they can have that same sort of switch about thinking about, you know, these sort of simplified Latinx narratives and thinking about how they are more complicated um, and there's sort of more layers to that. So I think it will always be a uh, material that I explore within my practice, but mm. it's sort of shifting. It's, I think it's always shifting where I am interested in having, you know, pink be like at the center of my practice. And then I'm, I'm interested in having it be um, a component of my practice. And so We'll see how it sort of shifts and changes over time, but it will definitely always be here. And I believe the um the color pink that's in the gallery walls, um, that was selected from um an ice cream shop that Caitlin, the curator, and you had visited in Chicago during one of the kind of early planning meetings, right? Well, the color pink it's, itself is is a hue that I've been using for the past okay. um, six years now, and it's a hue that's it's it's sort of a riff on this idea of Mexican pink, which is a lot um, deeper and uh, darker pink. But this is sort of a more lightened down version of, of that color, and you can see this um, like these different iterations of of the color. Um, coined as Mexican pink throughout um, Latinx neighborhoods here mm -hmm. in the U.S., but, you know, very much um, 
prominent within Mexican architecture in Mexico by architects like Baragan, you know, you can mm -hmm. see it in um, his creations in Mexico City and throughout Mexico. Right. And um, yeah, oh, Mer Meredith, if you want to share a little bit about the history of the of the color pink. Um, well, I just want to say really briefly, it was it was really interesting as, as I was talking to scroll through the images in the gallery and to see, and I hadn't really noticed it before, the kind of interplay between the white walls and the pink. And when you were talking about kind of pinkness and whiteness and how they sort of reinforce identity, but in a very restrictive sense. And it, it's true that I think pinkness, all pink in the 18th century, it also relates to this idea of kind of self-expression and the kind of sensuality and and pink is associated with blushing which is a, a way of of kind of expressing emotions on one's face but with white skin it's, it's usually associated specifically with with whiteness and so there's this kind of privileging of this ability to have a kind of uh -huh. intimate sensual sort of emotional response through this you know but but there's this racial undertone too in terms of who you know, who's able to kind of express this, to, to blush and to express this pinkness on their face. And so there is there is a that undertone. Um, and it's really interesting to me to, to hear that you're thinking about this in your work. And I think also, you know, I have this wonderful friend, colleague, Melissa Hyde, who's writing this essay about, it's called Men in Pink. And it's about mm -hmm. all of these kind of colonial um, traders who were also art patrons who are wearing these kind of pink jackets and these mostly pastel mm -hmm. portraits and in some cases there's an association with pinkness and um the material of cochineal which you know has an association with mexican colonial history and and there's an interest the french are kind of trying to produce it in the period and it's used often for this kind of very brilliant red pigment but then sometimes it gets mixed with white so there's also a kind of you know mm -hmm. a bit of a of a colonial association there mm -hmm. um, Well, wonderful. I'm, I'm going to move on to um, another. Um, oh, we actually had a uh, a comment about how the pink walls in Yvette's show um, so, kind of offer a glow to the white walls and other parts of the gallery spaces. So it offers this kind of like pinkish glow and especially, um, you know, in the evening. Uh, through because we have a lot of glass windows at the museum you can see the pink through the glass and that glow through the glass so there's this really nice kind of interplay pink that's spreading throughout the museum which is really nice <laughs> um uh the other question that we have from the audience um is from julia um yvette how does your family react or think about your work given its influences and your personal history embedded in they are very excited by it and they're definitely um I think very honored you know when I whenever I ask one of them if I can you know paint them because it is very much like an exchange that I have where when I'm conceptualizing a work and I'm thinking about you know who I'm interested in the moment and, and painting from either photographs from the past or thinking about having one of them sit for a photo for a new work I you know have a conversation and I ask if they're comfortable and if they're interested in and it's it's always excitement to be paint for them to be painted and I, I think it has a lot to do with um you know with us not engaging in these spaces with us really not having um, had like a familiarization with our history or feeling invited in museums etc and so I think that it's it's as important for um, for me to paint them as it also is for them to to be in these spaces when I'm having you know these exhibitions and openings and for them to to see themselves um, in art history uh, is really important and um, and part of the work also in itself. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really interesting, kind of like uh, their decision-making on photos, which ones they mm -hmm. prefer or not. <laughs> um, but it's definitely um, a collaboration and an open open conversation. Um, well, yeah. thank you for sharing, Yvette. Um, Can I just okay. say one quick thing about that? I, mm -hmm. I have taught Yvette's work and, you know, when I teach 18th century French art, 
I, you know, one way to really get the students excited is to show, you know, how some contemporary artists are kind of deeply engaged with it. And so I, I ended my, the lecture I taught last fall in the Rococo with some of, um, some of my like kind of bad iPhone camera photos of, of your work from the, the momentary and specifically the one of your sister kind of doing the Boucher, the Madame de Pompadour. And, and you had this <laughs> quote, I mean, I think, you know, your work is also really like kind of deadpan, like, like funny. I think that there's something that you said about your sister, you know, she's doing a kind of pompadour twist of her head, but she was wearing these leopard pajamas and mm -hmm. holding her phone. And it's this kind of radical resistance to be doom scrolling on your phone in leopard pajamas while the world is collapsing. It's like, you know, reference to COVID. And I just, you know, that was, wow. Like you, you just kind of had it all there in terms of like the personal history, but this kind of like the critique <laughs> and the resistance and, and, uh, and they loved that. And I think it really, you know, it, it's thank you for getting them excited about you know, about contemporary <laughs> art, which is, you know, an easier sell, but also about thinking of how it connects to to historical things. Maybe they're less interested in on, on the surface. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's, I mean, what, what an honor that you show my work to, to your students. That's amazing. Um, and yeah, I think it's kind of part of the, like the trickster in me, you know, with the material, but then also with um, some of these more kind of hidden, um, playful, like commentary that's deeply embedded within the work, or maybe it's part of the the drawing or, you know, the the inspiration or some of the research that happens before that doesn't really get seen in the finalized work, but is also important to, to the work itself. I definitely want to like, um, to go deeper into that, to, to be a lot more playful within the work. I think that there are moments where it feels like this specific work calls for more of a, a playfulness. And there's also moments where it feels like I have to redact some of that, but it's very much in the process of making the work too. Hmm. Um, we also have a question from Jennifer who would love to know what drew you, Yvette, to focus um, your studies on fiber and material studies during your MFA. Yeah, so I, I pursued um, a, a degree in painting for undergrad. And so it was very much concentrated in oil painting and, and there was some experimentation that happened uh, but I think that although I was you know recreating these like art historical portraits with oil painting and I was drawn to them I also I also kind of always felt this feeling to want to like reject painting and I always felt very much drawn and called to material within art making practices and so um to me, it felt very exciting to pursue fiber within um, my practice and to think about, you know, various other materials that I could explore. And so I actually applied with um, sculptural works that I had made during undergrad for um, my MFA that were all made out of real frosting. So it was like my last year of undergrad and I kind of rejected painting at that time and thought about painting more in a sculptural way um and then as i pursued my mfa and fiber and material studies i was thinking about you know all of the materials that i'm sort of exploring now but also um fiber and what they sort of look like within this more immersive space so really um helped me dive into the material heavy side of my practice great and then creating kind of this innovative form with um, using piping techniques with paint, right? So um, that kind of leads into this last question that um, is perfectly matched. Um, Kay is asking, I'm very interested in the cake piping alongside the Polly Pocket sized items. Can you talk more about the inclusion of found objects in your paintings? And so so there there aren't many found objects actually. Like it's, it's mostly like 80% all paint. But it's sometimes so relief that it looks like there are found objects within the painting itself. I would say within this um, surveillance locket series, the only found objects are the mirrors themselves. 
but everything else is created out of paint. Um, there are some other moments of collage that happen with actual toys within the portraits, the hammers and sunglasses. Um, but I'm really interested in sort of playing with paint, um, you know, aside from the, the piping, but play, playing with paint to have it really appear to be an object itself. So that's like another layer that happens where I, I feel like the audience kind of identifies some of these marks as being something other than paint itself. Um, but it's just very layered and very relief. And it's a it's a decision that happens as I'm creating the work and sort of, I think I intuitively get drawn maybe to include an actual object and have it be like more of a collage or to have, to again, maybe play the trickster and have that object look like it's an object, but it's really made out of paint. Right. We have... um. We have lots of school groups and kind of youth groups touring our exhibitions. Um, and we were able in our education team, um, our, some of our educators were able to find a vintage Polly Pocket on eBay. And so we bought one as mm -hmm. like a, you know, tool to use during our tours so and many. it really activates exactly <laughs> <laughs> so many great conversations and, um, and, and for a lot of millennials, just like a lot of nostalgia as well. So um, it's great to have all these kind of hints, at, um, kind of collective um, memories that a lot of us share in your work. Um, well, those are, um, I think, all of the questions I see here, and we're we're almost right past the hour. So I think this is a great place to pause and stop. Um, and I just want to thank both of you so much again. Thank you so much, Meredith, for taking such a deep look into Yvette's work and. Um, really, you know, deeply thinking and coming up with such great questions. And Yvette, thank you so much for sharing more about your work and your practice. It's really inspiring and such a great um, exhibition that we get to work with at the museum. Thank you um, both so much. And yeah, thank you, Meredith. Your questions were really um, amazing. And just thinking about my practice through, you know, a deeper lens of Rococo art history and I'm really excited to continue our conversation outside of this. No, me too. Thank you so much for your thoughtful answers and you know I just I learned so much just from this conversation and yeah I would I would love to 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 keep talking and thank you Namulan for putting it together and everyone for being here and this was really fun. Yes thank you everyone for joining us. Um, take care. Have a great night. <laughs> thank you all. Bye.